Добрий вечір всім. Команда Good evening everybody. Media Center Ukraine Ukraine Forum team uh, welcomes everybody who joined us and right now we have our guest from the European Regional Office of the World Health Organization. Uh, and now I am to give the floor to my co-moderator Vano uh, Bhatnagar. You are welcome. Thank you very much, Diakuyu, and uh, welcome to WHO Europe's uh, press briefing today from uh, Kyiv in Ukraine. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel. We have with us uh, WHO Regional Director for Europe, uh, Dr. Hans Kluge. Uh, joining him is Dr. Dorit Nitsan, our Ukraine Incident Manager, and she's also recently returned uh, from Zaporizhia, where she was welcoming uh, evacuees from Mariupol. Uh, and also we have our WHO representative uh, in Ukraine and head of Ukraine, Country Office for WHO, Dr. Gyarno Havic as well. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Kluge, uh, your opening statement, please. Good evening, Ukraine. I'd like to begin by expressing my immense appreciation and admiration for the health workers of this country who have shown tremendous bravery and dedication since the war began. You have done the impossible. You stand firm and save lives. As of today, WHO has verified 226 attacks on healthcare in Ukraine. That is almost three attacks per day since the 24th of February. They have left at least 75 people dead and 59 injured. Two-thirds of all attacks on healthcare this year, verified by WHO globally, have been in Ukraine. These attacks are not justifiable. They are never okay, and they must be investigated. It is an insult to the dedication and integrity of health workers everywhere that they continue with impunity. No health professional should have to deliver healthcare on a knife edge. But this is just what nurses, doctors, ambulance drivers, the medical teams of Ukraine are doing. You keep health services and hope alive in the face of unbelievable sorrow and suffering. I salute your courage and want you to know that WHO stands with you. This is my third visit to Ukraine this year and the second since late February. I am here for three main reasons. Firstly, I have been fortunate enough to meet some of the country's health heroes, to hear their stories, the challenges they face in delivering health care, and understand how WHO can continue to support them. Yesterday, I spent the day in Chernihiv Oblast with Minister Viktor Lashko, where I visited several hospitals and health facilities and spoke to professionals and patients. It was both heartbreaking and inspiring. Heartbreaking because the immense destruction to the health system and the devastating impact on people's lives. Inspiring because of the stories of resilience and perseverance. I heard of the ordinary citizens coming to the rescue of patients in hospitals under fire of doctors and nurses coming out of retirement to volunteer their services for free, of boats being used to get medicines to people when roads were inaccessible, and many individual stories of bravery and sacrifice. Secondly, I am here this week to meet national authorities and partners to get first-hand insights of what further action is needed now. Many health challenges lie before us. One in three people with a chronic condition struggle to access medicines. One third of tuberculosis patients are multi-drug resistant. And vaccine coverage for polio and measles remain below the recommended rate of 95%. With our dedicated teams, WHO is working with national authorities and partners responding to the immediate and long-term health needs of the Ukraine people those who have returned after being forced to flee, those who stayed, and those who are displaced within the country's borders. From what I saw yesterday while visiting Chernihiv, mental health services 
need to be further scaled up to reach communities. According to WHO, one in five people in conflict areas are likely to develop serious mental health problems. Over 16,000 people in Ukraine with moderate to severe mental health conditions face shortages of essential medicines. I am happy to see that the government of Ukraine, with the strong support of the First Lady, are putting mental health on the top of the agenda. According to the United Nations, sexual violence is a serious threat to mostly women and girls in conflict areas. I am deeply troubled by reports of an increase in sexual violence and exploitation in Ukraine, which ruins lives and is inadmissible. WHO is committed to meeting the health needs of survivors while doing everything we can to prevent sexual exploitation and abuse in the first place together with the government and the non-government organizations who I just met. We are also concerned about the potential of a cholera outbreak in occupied areas, where water and sanitation infrastructure is damaged or destroyed. That is why we are already pre-positioning cholera vaccines in our hub in Dnipro. Today, on day 83 of this war, we are starting to understand more about how the health system in Ukraine has been affected, and perhaps more importantly, what the long-term needs will be as we begin the long and challenging road to recovery. My third reason for being here is to put health at the heart of Ukraine's recovery and reconstruction efforts. Prime Minister Shmihal and I agree, health is not everything, but without health there is nothing. Even as we try to meet Ukraine's urgent health needs today, we are also looking ahead to the future and how we can help Ukraine's health system build back smarter, stronger and greener. For example, Power supply has been a consistent problem for many hospitals and health facilities that find themselves in active conflict areas. WHO has been working very hard to deliver generators to fill this gap. But looking more long term, we are working with the Ministry of Health to move towards renewable energies to power Ukraine's health system, ensuring reliability and sustainability for the future. And as your health workers represent hope in their local neighborhoods today, so the future health system must deliver people-centered services closer to the communities it serves, responsive and agile, mobile mental health, primary care and digital care services. Peace is a precondition for health. All our efforts to rebuild and reform could fail without peace. I would like to reiterate the call by the Secretary General, quote, for an immediate ceasefire and for an end to Russia war in Ukraine, unquote. These days I have borne witness to the incredible positivity, ingenuity and resilience of you, the Ukraine people. Doubly chose of you today, tomorrow and for a brighter healthier future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kluger, and uh, for, for, for those opening remarks. So we, we can go straight uh, to questions. If we have any in the room, uh, please do just raise your hands. We'll, we'll send a mic over, or if there are any questions uh, online. But in, in for the mo yeah, we can start with you here. Thank you. Hi, good Please introduce uh, yourself. Yeah, Charlotte Plantive, I work for AFP News Organization. Um, I would like you to come back on the um, uh, toll you said uh, initially about uh, 75 people who were killed in uh, health uh, infrastructure. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, we, I mean, what exactly are you after? Like where and locations and things? Because we, we don't give that... 
and who, who were the victims? Basically? So, well, the, uh, the, we verify the attacks on healthcare. They range from, uh, you know, hospitals, health facilities, ambulances, doctors, uh, uh, and uh, and we can give you a, a full breakdown of those 226. Like, how many of them were health facilities? How many of them were things like uh, supply lines or warehouses? Uh, but we don't divulge uh, locations or names, and you you appreciate for for security reasons. But um, I'd be happy to give you that breakdown uh, afterwards. Does anyone have anything to add? Uh, great. So please, next question. I'm Tatiana Zhukovina from Ukraine Forum. I have two questions. My first question is how many medical facilities have been damaged by shelling at the moment? How many of those have been verified by the WHO? And my second question is uh, how much supplied have been chronic patients with the essential medicines they need? First question, I think I've sort of answered uh, for, for, for this other lady. We, we, we don't give actual details about where those attacks took place. It's our job to verify them uh, as WHO. But as the regional director made very clear, we will contribute to any investigation and we, we would take part in those investigations should, should they happen in the future and they should be uh, investigated. The second question was around uh, people with chronic conditions and their access to medicines. So uh, Dr. Habit will take that question. Thank you. And um, just to elaborate slightly on attacks on health, we are aware that the government has uh, is looking to over 500 uh, casualties. As a WHO, as of today, we have verified 228 attacks on health, which include facilities like primary health care, which few I have been visiting in the past days, which include ambulances, which includes hospitals that we had a chance together with the regional director, Hans Kluge, to visit yesterday in Chernihiv. And what is important, what was mentioned also earlier, that two-thirds of all the attacks on health in 2022 are taking place in Ukraine. We have looked back also what services these facilities provided and how many people benefited from them. And if we look back to 2021, every month quarter of a million civilians, Ukrainians, had a chance to be served in those facilities or by ambulances. It's a quarter of a million a month. So that's the impact of those attacks, and those attacks are continuing, which is unacceptable, and there is no reason for that. Coming to supplies, WHO has delivered more than 500 metric tons of medical supplies in the first months since 24th of February. These mainly concentrated on trauma and injury care, which until now are over 50% of all the supplies WHO has been delivering. Our supplies include medicines, different equipment to treat patients, ambulances, electric generators, many which are needed for the healthcare system. When we look to the chronic care, WHO provides currently interagency medical kits, which are for primary health care. These medical kits are delivered either through the authorities to the hospitals, but also together with our partners like UK Med, MSF, to the hard to reach places. One of the medical kit allows three months treatment for thousands of people, and those include also those with the chronic diseases. If you have hypertension, if you have diabetes, or any other chronic condition. So this is what WHO does, but we are very glad to see that also government and many partners are also delivering supplies for the chronic diseases. And this is what we have seen also around Kiev, in Kiev Oblast, where the areas are re-liberated, people are returning, and they need access to medicine, which is provided by hospitals. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Habit. Are there any further questions from the room or online? Um, in which case, I might actually give the floor for a, a few words to Dr. Dorrit, if you wouldn't mind telling us about uh, your time in Zaporizhia and, and uh, welcoming those evacuees from Mariupol and what you see as the health needs uh, of, of people arriving. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, these were very tough days. Uh, we joined the UN uh, mission that um, with the ICRC, they went inside Mariupol to evacuate the people that could get out. Not everybody did get out, and that is very sad because those who stayed behind are staying, as we hear from our colleagues and, and uh, partners, are not doing well. Those who got out, uh, some of them arrived with their private vehicles, Many of them were uh, welcomed at the front line with volunteers from Ukraine uh, proper, from Zaporizhia and other regions. People came with vehicles and pu pu pulled people out and gave them uh, the care on the road to us. Many cars had the Red Cross on them, telling us that these were sick people and signs that there were children or pregnant women in the car. We ran to those cars to help the people to triage together with MSF and UNICEF. We were on the ground and uh, with the doctors, the amazing doctors, nurses, and volunteers from the Parisia region. Everybody was there to help and move forward those who needed care. Later on, buses arrived. Those buses brought the most in need, those that couldn't get into the other vehicles. We went on, th on the buses, helped them to get out, provided the wheelchairs, the stretchers, and helped the medical team there to continue with care. During the days that we were there, we also had the time to assess the needs in the hospitals in Zaporizhia and later, later on in Dnipro and we provided them with more of those medical kits that uh, Dr. Abich just mentioned, as well as many other uh, consumables, oxygen generators, and whatever they needed. More is on its way, and more people are in need of coming out. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nitsan, for that. And I believe we have a question online, if you have your headpieces in, uh, panelists, uh, from uh, Sarah Heiser from uh, Politico. Sarah, if you could ask your question, please. If you could unmute and ask. So in the earlier days of the war. Sorry, can you start again? Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Um, in the earlier days of the war, uh, we heard Dr. Mike Ryan commending the healthcare system and the COVID surveillance for holding up despite the war. Um, I'm just wondering if we could get an update on the COVID testing, surveillance, cases, hospitalizations in Ukraine, and whether the growing number of attacks on healthcare, uh, how that's bearing on the, the pandemic situation in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. For people in the room who might not have heard it, it was a question about uh, COVID uh, in Ukraine and uh, a bit of an update on the situation, also given the attacks on healthcare. Um, Dr. Hubbard, would you like to take that? Thank you, Sarah. And uh, it is an important question as while the war goes on in Ukraine at the global level, as well in Ukraine, the COVID pandemic is not over. And in that environment, it's very, very important to build back the surveillance system for COVID, as well use whatever possible ways to have surveillance for any uh, diseases. This is an area which we have been discussing with uh, public health authorities and the regional public health centers. And in the current environment, uh, we see that uh, the surveillance system can be strengthened for COVID, but importantly also for other communicable diseases. We are aware that uh, there are 
small COVID outbreaks among the um, people who have fled to western part of Ukraine and the treatment and support is provided to them. But what is important that the COVID surveillance needs to be in place, and that has been also part of the discussions in the past days. At the same time, in many areas, we see that the COVID vaccination is scaled up. This we see in the areas of Pucha, Irpin, I have been able to visit in the past weeks that among the vaccination program that uh, national authorities are scaling up, first of them is COVID-19 vaccination. And we have reviewed that the country has available more than 10, 10 million doses of COVID vaccine. So now it's the time to scale up the vaccination, ensure that those who are vulnerable have access to the booster dose, and to ensure that we are ready for the coming months and the season. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Dr. Habit. Um, I don't think we have any further questions uh, online or uh, in the room. So uh, we can close this uh, press briefing for today. Uh, if uh, Do you want to say any final words? Great. So we will close the press briefing for today. If you have, oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. There is another question uh, online. Um, one, one moment. Yes, from the New York Times. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, please, uh, and ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much. You spoke of concerns about a uh, possible cholera outbreak in occupied areas. Uh, could you just explain what access the WHO has to those occupied areas, and, and is it delivering some kind of medical services in those areas at this time? Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Very good question. I'll hand that straight to Dr. Nitsan, who has been in, in that part of the country. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, the occupied territories, and especially we know of Mariupol, where the water supply was probably uh, partially back, put back, uh, many pipes are broken, and we got uh, from our partners on the ground, the NGOs that are working day and night, we got the information that there are um, swamps, actually, in the streets, and the water, sewage water and drinking water are getting mixed. So this is a huge uh, hazard. It's hazard for many infections, including cholera, and we all remember that in 2011 there was cholera cases in uh, Mariupol. So we are getting ready, um, with, as we heard, with the cholera kits, with the vaccines, and working closely with the uh, NGOs, our implementing partners, that are able to go into Mariupol to support the people. So we are there with our NGOs partners. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Nitsan. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank the, would you, yeah, I'd like to thank the panel uh, once again, uh, Dr. Kluge, Dr. Nitsan, uh, and Dr. Habic. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kluge, for this uh, trip to Ukraine. And I'm sure you'll be back. Um, and with that, I'd like to close the press briefing. If you have any questions, uh, you can email uh, the WHO Europe press office uh, at eupress at, at who.int. <laughs> Thanks very much, and good evening.